I'm going to continue the public session. Um, the executive session litigation RIGL 42 46582 Four Corners has been continued until after the public session. <coughs> Approval of consent agenda. Approval of executive session meeting minutes of May 29, 2018. Approval of executive session meeting minutes of May 14, 2018. Receipt of, receipt of minutes from the following boards and commissions. The Prevention Coalition Committee, Planning Board 2, Cemetery Commission, and the Senior Center Newsletter. Correspondence received and filed. Barryville uh, Town Council resolutions in support of H 8120A and S2905 related to the Energy Facilities Sitting Act. Susan Gill, Administrative Officer for Planning Board May Activity Report. Town Administrator, Police and Fire Overtime Reports for May. Town Administrator, May Monthly Department Reports. Would anyone from the Council like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Madam President. No, I'd like, no. like to make a motion to approve the entirety of the consent agenda. Second. Yeah. Motion to remain second. All those in favor? Do I have anything? Open forum? No. Okay. Open public forum, announcements, comments, questions, presentation. Linda Lawson, Tim the Day, July 27th, 28th, and 29th. Approval for weekend events. <laughs> Yes, we did, did, yeah, that. before you got here. Before you got here, you missed it. You can do it if you want to. You want me to do it again, Well, Hi, Linda. Hi. It's that time of year again, so we're uh, coming before you to request approval for the Tibetan Day celebration, July 27th, 28th, 29th. We are once again asking and requesting um, it to be a town-sponsored event as approved last year. Um, committee has been meeting, um, all open meetings um, have being held at the library, and if anyone wants to attend, our next meeting is this Thursday at 6.30. Um, same set of years, uh, years past, a little bit of variation in the schedule, um, but we do still meet all the requirements of it being on town property, um, accessible and open to all, as well as all events being free. Um, I've met with the Tiverton Police Department, the Fire Department, as well as the DPW, and along with the Town Administrator this morning. The Recreation Committee, we are due to on their, uh, we're on their agenda to meet with them uh, tomorrow. They had to cancel their meeting last week and move it due to some business travel. So if you review the schedule, um, and I provided you with a, a backup document of events, the Friday evening, um, we're requesting um, at this point, both Spicasset Field as well as the high school for a potential location um, due to the Grinnells Beach being closed. Um, we are also requesting a sound variance on Friday evening because of band. We're going beyond acoustics and it will be amplified, so a sound variance is being requested. Same food trucks as the prior year. If it's being held at Picasso, there will not be a bonfire. Um, if it's being held at the high school, there will might potentially be a bonfire um, subject to fire marshal and, and fire chief as well as school approval. So that's Friday evening. Unfortunately, no lighted flotilla because we're obviously we're not down, down at the beach. Saturday, um, par parade as scheduled, um, staging at 9. You have the parade route as well as the staging area diagram. Um, exactly the same as in years past. Step off is at 10, and the parade will run from Family Ties to Lil Bear, um, which is roughly 1.6 miles. In the afternoon, we're looking at a family activity um, at the library um, in conjunction and partnership with the Tiverton Arts Council, and it will be a family and children's activity with painting and storytelling and very similar to the activities of, in the past with uh, Mrs. Pelletier leading, leading that effort. Sunday, um, we've held beach yoga down on Grinnell's Beach. Um, turnout's been about 30, 45 people, give or take. I do know that the beach is closed. However, I am requesting that you do open, if applicable, and safety has all been met and, and DPW agrees to, to those conditions um, between 8 and 9.30 to hold beach yoga on early Sunday morning um, in conjunction with the Coastal Roasters Coffee like we've done in the past. I am requesting from the rec committee both um, Grinnell's Beach as well as Foglin Beach um, as a backup location um, if that request does not get, get approved or granted. In the afternoon, as in years past, the Tiverton Fire Department is planning their family open house. 
um, very well attended by families in the past. I think we had about 175 children and families go through there last year. Um, and that would be 10 to 2 at the Tiverton Fire Department Main Road Station. So the location change on Friday is, is a change from years past. Amplification of a band versus an acoustic act, act is a change. Um, we are not having the movie night on Saturday night. Feedback from last year it was just a lot for families and it was a lot for the committee. There were a number of events, um, you know, one right after the other. So we'd like to move that movie night potentially in conjunction with another event that will held potentially maybe with the bonfire if we can't have it or our fall festival when we do the pumpkins. So something, something like that. So it's a change as well. Other than that, we do have the parade form filled out, the state approved one that needs to be signed by the, the uh, police chief and submitted to the state. Um, any permitting for the food vendors, um, we have those applications um, as well as the uh, health and safety um, food license that's required. So we're aware of that, you know, as well. So as far as the sound variants, they don't have to be put on another agenda because do we approve that? That's what mm -hmm. Right. That'll yeah. be that's so that'll have to be advertised yeah. for the yeah. so be if she has yep. the location yeah. you need the location for it obviously. yeah so yeah but that's because it's here which I see mm -hmm. so it, yeah it is and and I, I because of the rec committee it's being yeah and because of the of the rec committee move, uh, meeting being moved that was that was yeah. what um, you know yeah, so we'll why just we're put this at on the next the next meeting. one. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the other thing is, is always, you know, money. Um, so we do have a balance carryover from last year um, with an additional uh, couple of donations that came in. We do have sponsors lined up for this year as well. So we'd be covering the cost of, you know, the band or, or any of the other, you know, incidentals as we did last year as well. And we provided you with a, with a post report um, and we would do that again also. You guys paid for the police and fire details, didn't you? Um, we paid for whatever, yeah, whatever charges. We paid for the DPW um, the overtime. Police. We okay. paid for DPW overtime because they moved the pallets for us. They had additional barrels. They had to do a pickup on Saturday morning of the trash. Um, so there was additional additional charges for DPW. And there was a police detail also. Um, we paid a uh, police detail, I want to believe, for the movie night. Um, yeah, and they were all there remember again I, I I'm not I'm up, not I don't remember I'd have to I'd have to go back I know that the but that's all going to be arranged anyway to make sure yeah whatever whatever charges I mean that's however we had talked about this last year regarding this being a town sponsored event and those costs being absorbed by the community by the town um, but for those sort types of services but Again, we're we're requesting, you know, that it be a town sponsored event and we cover yeah, there was a there was a actually um Councilor Edwards um, you know, talked about potentially putting in a budget and I know it didn't get put in the budget. Um and things are incredibly tight, so we will cover the additional costs, whatever is, is needed for those services. Yeah, I was just asking because I wasn't sure what you paid for <laughs> last year. I'm sure we got it, but I don't remember. Um now Yoga at Grinnell's Beach. Is there a safety issue with letting people in there? With uh, there's barriers right now. You cannot get in there without climbing over things. Um, I looked at it this morning. There is one way to get to the beach that doesn't have to take you through the construction area, which is actually stepping over where the guardrail goes down, and it's going right by the fence right, to the beach. Yeah. You're not the only one, I think. <laughs> but is there a liability to, to not have a clear access there? And people have to climb over a guardrail? I'm just asking. Which is like knee high at that, that point, but. Yes. Put a temporary ramp or something? Yeah, well, that's what I'm wondering. Should we, I mean, can we move it or can we somehow provide a better access to it? Like, what what I can do is. It's too far, but I understand the. I can work it's with DPW to see if there is any other place where we can temporarily well, open the fence, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Oh, I know. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Because but if I, somebody hurts, I know it's only knee-high. Would it be possible to... somebody falls over it and there wasn't a clear... Would it be possible to unbolt a section of that guardrail so they can walk through there and then put it back when, we, when we're done? The state owns that, don't they? What's that? Doesn't the state own that? Yeah, well, but I mean... 
we're talking about talking about the state. This is a, a, actually a very complicated yeah. um, issue when it comes to liability. There's an interplay between the state and the town. There's a question about whether or not the recreational use statute applies here. There's also a question about whether or not this is an open and obvious defect. And then there's a question about whether or not the town is negligent for allowing people to get, get into this situation where there's likely to be <coughs> an accident. So there's a, there's a couple of moving parts here. It's not, not that easy to say. Uh, to me, the question is less liability, um, you know, ultimately, but, you know, whether or not you're putting people in a position where they might get hurt and there's a good risk for them doing that. Do you want to want to actually do that? It's just something just you got to think about. Yes. It is. Go ahead. Yeah. May I? I would suggest that perhaps you ask me to work with DPW to look at the situation, make sure that there is a, a safe way to get to the beach one way or another, uh, and it also should satisfy the solicitor. Can I ask one question, Joe, about that? Is there a, since the, there's no parking at Grinnell's, is there a parking plan for the folks who want The town owns a paper lot behind the red dory, um, and that's the parking lot that we would advise folks to use. Mm -hmm. And it's from 8 to 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. Oh, behind there? That behind the red door, yeah, there's a grass know, lot, yeah. and it's a town-owned parking. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a town-owned paper lot, um, and that's where the, we, we used on Friday evening as well last mm -hmm. year, and that's where we would advise people to park. Um, we certainly wouldn't advise them to park in anyone's business, um, you know, lo lot location or on the street for permitting, and I know there's stickers through that neighborhood. Well, I'm sure the recreation is going to have some talk up, up, about having it at Grinnell's <coughs> Parks Park and also we'll see what they conclude. Also. You're going, she's going before the yeah, recreation. Tomorrow. tomorrow. Right. tomorrow. Is, is Bogland not an option? Is that not a good option? Um, it, it's further away. It doesn't connect to Coastal Roasters, um, who is also sponsoring, you know, you get a free coffee and, you know, um, Nana Quackett Yoga is volunteering her time. Um, it's, it's just a better centrally located location um, for it. If it has to be moved this year, if it's not safe for public, it's not accessible for all. We certainly understand, but I am requesting the hour and a half from 8 to 9.30 to get folks out of there and over to Coastal Roasters, if, if possible. So you'll work with it in conjunction with the Recreation Committee and Tony? Yes. And you'll work with Linda regarding that? And we may need a little help from DPW to yeah. create something that's safe passage. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm just... I just don't want anyone to get hurt. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Subject, subject to safety is is the our number one concern. There must, there might be a way. Any other questions from the council? Madam President. Yes. Do we need to vote on anything? Uh, we need to um, approve right. these events yes. subject to recreation, of, uh, right? Approval. Approve, approve as town sponsored yeah. event. As a town sponsored. We'll make a motion. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> just so make a motion, yeah. <laughs> so may I ask one question just to clarify because I, I think I asked this last year and, and I just want to be clear. What does town sponsored mean? Because it's not something we do all the time. So what what does that mean when we call it town sponsored? I'll give it the first try. In, in my opinion, it simply means that the town recognizes that this is um, a good event for the community and likes to support it and by being a sponsored event it becomes eligible for some uh, preferential treatment if if you will in terms of what needs to be paid by the organizers to the town as well I think that was the, the issue yeah. that was well, addressed, the addressed and the insurance well, right, really right. They, piggyback, they piggyback on the trust slide the trust policy for the town Yes, I, I understand that it's going to be the TULIP uh, program uh, uh, this oh, year for it that. It is. Yes, mm -hmm. but this allows that to happen. Okay. Okay. And then, I'm, I'm sorry to be picky about this, but I just want to be clear only because I went through this with the fundraising for Grinnell's Beach. So, is the account, are the funds held here or do Linda, do you hold the funds privately in your entity's account and then we, how does that? No, work? the funds are held here. We, do, we have an account with the town treasurer um, and the account number is. Oh, that's all right. I yeah, we have, uh, I don't, um, no, the funds are held here. We submit the invoice for reimbursement 
um, if there's a if there's an invoice for like an example last year for the movie contract um, you know we, we had deposited all the sponsor checks and we submitted the invoice for reimbursement okay so and the treasurer paid that up yes okay. so one question only because we ran into this with Grinnell's where there is an account here for Grinnell's as well and that you know donations were made out to the town of Tiverton there were certain entities that we could not accept donations from um, because either they were coming in front of the council or coming to the town wanting something or there is there is some current legal situation does th that need to I, I don't know in a town sponsor oh, event does that matter not matter and I haven't had a chance to talk with Linda about this but um, I did have a conversation about it today and based on that I think it might be would be good if we could talk about a different solution ie a different place for the monies to be held whether that happens this year or at least in coming years um, just looking at what the different options are to keep a, a clean separation might be worthwhile but <coughs> that's a surprise to Linda because I didn't hadn't thought about this when we talked this morning so so Tiverton celebrates as a filed not-for-profit and we do have an account with a, a balance of $25 to keep it open at Bank Newport so if need be um, that's what I figured yeah. you know there yeah because last year we ran into the casino but this year it wouldn't be a problem with the casino it wouldn't be a problem so I uh, again we do have a, an account here um, I don't know if the clearance of who's giving us money versus you know I mean it's it's, it's individuals it's businesses if it's all right with everybody and I apologize that we weren't able to arrange all this beforehand but I think um, I can work with the treasurer and Linda to work out you know what the procedure will be from here on in all honesty I, I think for um, control um, and transparency I mean having an account with the town um, and those funds aren't held in a separate not-for-profit if this is a town sponsored if there's you I know. think the transparency can be addressed there is a just a tricky little legal issue with uh, the source of donations and to what extent that become could become a problem for the town and I hadn't thought of that before but I think it's a, a legitimate concern that we're better off addressing okay so uh, and this would be the same for any other um, any other program any other recreation committee or a recreation committee is a town entity and that makes it different right there but um, there may well be issues in terms of you know if, if the committee does fundraising if a similar issue comes up that we would need to look at but this is really because you remain your own nonprofit entity mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons it would actually be better for everybody involved okay. I think to keep the finances different you the transparency can also come through your reports which mm -hmm. I think is a, is a great arrangement mm -hmm. you know, the, the proactive report and the post event report mm -hmm. you can really include a lot of that information including about details and you mm -hmm. know what was paid by whom for what mm -hmm. so you're saying not the at town I think that's still town sponsor because you don't necessarily charge you know full fees or anything right. like that so but can't Linda just when she gives when she gets these donations just okay it with someone here to make sure that that person or entity is okay I personally no objection to it someone approved it earlier so it was done this way last year it's just I think that councilwoman Hilton raises a legitimate concern with the source of donations and to what extent that could come back to bite us so to speak so the vote here tonight can still remain a town sponsored event okay and the financial part of this will be arranged between all of you madam president yes um i'd like to make a motion to approve tiverton days as a town sponsored event and direct the administrator to work with <coughs> Linda and the committee to sort out the financial issue, um, as well as ask the uh, uh, administrator to work with the solicitor and uh, DPW director to sort out uh, the Grinnells versus Fogland um, debacle as it pertains to the beach yoga. Also with the recreation committee. Also with the recreation committee, Second. subject to approval from the rec committee. 
Okay. I'll second it. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. I'm watching you. Ready to go. Conservation Commission, uh, Thomas Walensky, underground storage tanks, a very grave environmental threat in Tivenin, solicited a memorandum <coughs> regarding local re regulatory options. Tom? Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Tom Ramatowski, Chairman of the Conservation Commission. Uh, we have a presentation for you here tonight being set up, and while Tom's setting it up over there, let's give you a very brief introduction to what the presentation will be about. Um, as <clears throat> the title implies, it's about underground storage tanks, but not the ones we're typically here about, which are septic related. These are now underground metal tanks people installed them back in the old days when we were having the price shocks for oil 70s a long time ago and they're used to store oil and other sorts of uh, fuel and as you know the Conservation Commission is responsible for keeping you abreast of issues related to uh, water keeping our water pure keeping our water in good shape both surface and underground and as we did more and more research on this topic we found that it is really really a concern that we should have as a town because as you'll see in the presentation there are lots of these things that were put in 30 40 years ago they're all ticking time bombs potentially still full of fuel or partially full of fuel uh, could leak at any time causing a real environmental disaster especially in the parts of town that depend on well water uh, for their drinking water or if it happened near our reservoir like Stafford Pond we could be in big trouble too so uh, I guess we're, we're still being set up, but that's the gist of the, the introduction that I wanted to give on this. Uh, Tom Malinsky, who'll be giving it, has done a lot of research on this topic and worked with uh, Rhode Island DEM uh, as well. Uh, so uh, hopefully we're able to... I think we're looking for something. I looking think we're looking for the clicker. Maybe oh, okay. to, but. I think you can click unless you're feeling especially tall and can reach the button. Oh, that too. All right. No. <laughs> Michael Jordan in the audience. The cabinet that's over there. It's underneath. Uh, it's right behind over here. Oh, it's over. Yeah, yeah they, they rolled it back there. The, uh... No, it's good. It's on wheels. It comes out so they can set up the system. There right. it is. Found. <laughs> Good call, John. We're going to have to put a uh, velcro on it and stick it next to the sound system. We got it. So we're on? Yeah. Council Hill is wrecking the whole joint for that. Why didn't you just leave your chair? I was just going to take the second This is exercise. <laughs> Oh, it's a wheelchair. Should we uh, dim the lights a little bit, or? We're working on that now. Beautiful. Okay, so we're ready to roll, and uh, without any further delays, introduce uh, Tom Malinsky from our commission, who's our expert on this topic, who's going to give you the uh, talk tonight, which is, again, underground storage tanks, a very grave environmental threat in Tiverton, and actually throughout the entire state. there if you want to, if you could sit and do the presentation that All way right. you can click yeah. and control I it. Get so used to standing up that it's a yeah, okay. Yeah, we yeah, just, they, they won't be able to hear you if you don't use the mic. 
All right, I'll sit down then. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again for your sharing your precious time this evening to talk about this very special topic. I think we have to concern ourselves with. Usually, I start a presentation with like a upbeat discussion or a small story, but. It's looking at, as I say, very grave. It is an issue that we have to re work with. And I think if we can work collaborative, collaboratively together as a team, eventually we can come up with a solution to this. This was a long story, this uh, meeting, of many years, long history. My, 31 years ago, I sat in this seat and my coworker, Dick Miles, uh, came and presented at the town council and we were able to get a uh, Ordinance Pass, which is no longer allowed USDs to be installed inside in, in the town of Disney. Of course, even, and there was also a registration program, of course, as I'll discuss later on. So we're here tonight to, I think, fulfill what I was hoping to do, we would get totally remove all the tanks eventually, and I hope the presentation will help us look at it in that light. Uh, so we'll continue on with this and is um, I'd like to re refrain possibly from questions until we get to the end because I'll streamline the presentation and I'll keep my thoughts and continuity so if you don't mind that we could have all of that at that point so I wanted the goal was to summary of the meeting discuss the UST environmental crisis and dividend review the EM regulations discuss failure modes real world examples I made, we made some recommendations as a team and we have NLB questions with a final goal of working together and collaboratively to find a viable solution to this very critical environmental issue. Sorry, could get some water. Right now, based upon a fire department oil tank license uh, spreadsheet, there are, tw there are 207 plus or minus unknown USTs in Tibetan. Many install, as Tom mentioned, during the oil embargo days. 207, I say known. I know of instances where tanks, I looked at the list, I knew people who I had underground storage tanks, and they never were listed. I know that list is probably out of date, and we'll address that later on, but as at least 207 that is on that list. Leakage of the tanks can impact our fractured bedrock aquifer that as we have in our town, <coughs> the granite uh, bedrock, and the water, watersheds are both staffed in aquifer pans. And all it takes is one gallon of fuel oil or gasoline to contaminate one million gallons of drinking water. That's all it takes. So it's quite a, in, a quite a aggressive contaminant with regards to uh, water. Current DEM regulations, they do not address heating oil tanks, residential or farm, with less than or equal to 1,100 gallons. Whereas any other thing above, above 1,100 gallons, DEM does regulate them. And any other fuel other than heating oil, gasoline, diesel, kerosene, K1, kerosene, other hazardous materials, they regulate all of them no matter what capacity. But if you look at, again, based upon the 1,100 gallon tank, you could potentially, a leak could make 1 billion, 1,100 uh, 100 million gallons of water not drinkable. That's how, it's such an issue that we have to contend ourselves with. And the issue is we're dealing with some tanks potentially in the ground for 40 years right now. So you know there's a very good possibility some may be leaking, and we do not know that because there may be a public air, public water supply where it is leaking and it's not bothering perhaps that immediate area. They usually fail in terms of the rust per perforation mechanisms. It's usually from the inside uh, out. Moisture combines with the interior tank sediment. It's usually at the bottom of the tank. Ask any fisherman, they'll tell you that they're, they're fuel tanks. There's always bacteria that's under the bottom of them and sediment because fuel oil, number, number two fuel oil, is, it's a dirty fuel. And it combines with bacteria and, and constituents like sulfur and forms a crude acid. And bacteria living at the water oil interface creates digestive, uh, digest organics and excretes acid. So you have this acidic solution at the bottom, and it does eventually cause perforation of tanks. And the same applies to above ground tank. And I'll just show a small presentation, a single slide on that too. 
Here's an example from a DEM publication of a tank. And, you know, we, they talk about the inside out, but you can tell that perhaps the interaction of acid uh, soils and acid rains, that's an example of a tank that, that they, uh, of course, condemned uh, and they took out of the ground. And <clears throat> usually they say if it's a, just a pinprick size hole, we'll leak about a 400 gallons of fuel per year. And that's not, you know, for some people, if they're running a lot of fuel during uh, heating season, they may not detect that, and that's the problem. <coughs> In above ground tanks, some people do have them outside. They actually, in cold climates, they breathe. The sun hits them and it causes contraction and, and expansion. And air enters from the vent pipe, bringing moisture in. The moisture then combines with the sediment at the bottom, as we said before, an acid sludge, sludge is formed. And there also could be roof spillage from, from above a bad gutter that's filled up and it fills, puts water over the vent pipe and brings it inside the tank. So these are one of the prime examples, as you can hear, here's a February 18th newsletter from DEM. They had emergency response spills of 570, resulted in that 530 gallons of oil being recovered, 723 tons of oil spill debris, and pre residential oil spills accounted for 30%. Now, oil spills can be both spills when you're trying to fill a tank, the tank actually burst because they put high pressure uh, fuel into it, about 100 pounds, and, and the DEM person told me they sometimes cause the tanks to fail. The outside tanks, the 275 gallons tanks, and now they're made very thinly made metal. They, they really can, once they're rusted, you, they just can't take the abuse anymore. So uh, this is this concern we should have with even the outside tanks. And of course, who resumes the responsibility? It's the homeowner if something leaks in time in their yard and, uh, and causes contamination. Here's an example of leak proof solution. I'm not endorsing the Roth company, but these are double walls which can be used to prevent any leakage outside. You can be used inside the house, and I know a couple of people, I you know one has three tanks, coupled with two of them. The bottom line is it's the ideal solution to prevent a, a, uh, a leak, and it'll capture it before it goes into your basement or in, somewhere in your yard and cause contamination. Here's an example of heating oil contaminations in Rhode Island. You probably don't regret, I mentioned this individual, Dick Miles, and myself. Dick lived on Montgomery Street, 1984. It was undisclosed U.S. tea leak. No one knows really where, as far as I know, was, no one said where, the, where it originated from. But the neighborhood was out without drinkable water for seven years. They had the, uh, the uh, National Guard, I think they call them water dogs, outside this, the street, and they were using that to drink water, and it required a $5 million bond to, for installation, which eventually, for Lawrence Avenue and Mon Montgomery Street, w was able to get water, town water, after all that time. Tibbet in the early 80s, this was a friend of mine, the uh, interior tank leak. It was bedded, embedded in cement. He had a, a plugged up line, the oil coming to the side. Well, let me, we'll blow air in it and burst the, thing, burst the pipe under the cement. And he had a remediation cost of $80,000. Had to dig all the way around his foundation. So it was quite a, an expense at that time. And here's an example of an incorrect, in, in uh, Dr. JP's uh, dental practice, 366 gallons, and the remediation cost of about $1.5 million. So here we, here's examples of really large costs, which I'll show a subsequent see, a sheet on that also. And Warwick, this was in 2014, an interior tank leak, remediation cost was 150000 to clean up, and they eventually demolished the house and the people moved away. They didn't figure it was not worth it. There's more uh, examples of leaks, but I was able to, these are some of the ones that had some, I had actual data from. Here's an example of replacement. If you wanted to just, this is a simple replacement. This is a middle town friend of mine, two tanks, 275 regular or steel tanks. He put one Roth in, the cost was take away the tanks, remove the uh, residual oil that was left over, $2,500, which isn't bad compared to what it could be for, for a cleanup. Here's a Tivit in one, one tank, 275 gallons, one Roth, 1,700. And this is one where we just removed the tank and we never replaced it. $375, that's not big cost to when you're trying to uh, fix a potential environmental problem. 
I received this quote from A. Barber Environmental. That was the same firm that cleaned up Dr. JP's uh, facility at the dentist's office. If it's not leaking, the chief of, if it's less than 1,100 gallons, the chief of the fire department is notified. And the only cost would be about $1,800 to $2,100. If a UST underground storage tank with limited surrounding soil uh, contamination, he says, will cost between fifteen to 25000 And anything <coughs> above a large area, 100000 plus. So you can see why the, the, the dentist, Dr. JP, had a $1.5 million type because it was a extensive uh, contamination. So I can, as you can see, the clearly the proactive removal of is the most cost-effective option. You can, that's, that's, anyone could see that. Some of the proactive measures that are being taken by the heating oil delivery service. One delivery service sent a certified letter to those customers saying they will no longer deliver heating oil to a home utilizing UST. One of the examples in there where my friend had two tanks removed, he was the one who received the letter from the Tiverton oil firm who said they thought he had a UST and he really didn't. He had those two tanks in the basement. But they were telling him they're not going to take responsibility anymore. They told the customer, we're stopping. And there's a Tiverton plumber and oil burner service firm stated they will no longer serve as heating equipment with a concealed under cement heating oil line. Because again, they do not, do not want to take the same responsibility that if it leaks, someone has to clean it up and someone has to pay for it, and that's the homeowner. I spoke to my, my, all my insurance company, and they will no longer issue policies to a home with the UST, as well as real estate agents action if one is selling a home with the UST, they do want, they want to be moved. This, for the non-believers, and I, I suspect there were probably could have been some non-believers here this evening. This is an old February 2008, and I tried to call. They actually had a number in the, in the, in the, on the internet, but they never answered the phone. It rang. There was represents 1,883 contaminated sites, uh, and this was related to fuel oil tanks in Rhode Island. Summary. I. We as a team, the uh, Conservation Committee, say it is a major environmental concern for the public in bringing water supplies, both public as well as the private wells. And I'd love Tiverton to take the lead because the state truly does not, is not taking the lead when it comes to the anything less than uh, uh, 1,100 gallons. And I ask anybody here, in the event of a major UST leak, how could the town fund a public's water supply to residents in Tiverton Four Corners? It took seven years to get the $5 million bond to help Florence Street and Montgomery Street people out. This would be a tremendous amount of money to try to go through all the ledge that's in front and to bring it down to four corners. It would never happen. So people would be out without water for many years. And so this is the big issue that I think we have to re take a hold of and say, how do we resolve it? So there's some recommendations from the town, and we need to work with this as a team. This is something that was put out now because you always want to have recommendations and, and options. This probably could be called options and then a, a true recommendation, but I think we cannot, as a uh, conservation committee, make the true recommendation. We have to work with the team members here, the council. But request that we re-register all the tanks. As I said before, I know people did not even register. You know, people, some people are independent, and they won't follow the rules. So um, I think we need to get that list upgraded. Uh, Jan has a copy of it. I gave him a uh, scanned copy of it. I, and it's inside the safe on a, uh, in the office. Include both commercial and, and residential. Get the installation date, sizes, and contents. The Tibetan Fire Department could generate a database. It's a simple expel, 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 spreadsheet and, and talk about if it was, find out if it was in use or abandoned or removed. <coughs> abandoned being abandoned in place where they maybe filled it with sand or some slurry, cement slurry. Send certified letters to known Tibetan Patrol and dis delivery service to tell them if you have a, no VSTs, you have to inform us because maybe that's the only way you're going to find out. People in their backyards will not tell you they have a USD. And the Tiverton Conservation and, Tia, and Tiverton, Fire Department could, Tiverton Fire Department could collaboratively develop an information sheet to tell 
what people need to do to safely remove their USDs. We need to uh, validate of all the 1,100 gallon USTs are in fact registered by DEM. I was able to get a sample from DEM of three tanks, one of them in South Tivit in 4,000 gallons, one in two in North Tivit in of 1,000 gallons each, and one at a elderly home. And I'm saying the elderly home one because they have the best tank ever. Perfect drawings that have a dual wall tank. It was done professionally. The one in South Tivit and it shows the house which someone took a pencil and said, drew a kind of irregular rectangle tank. That's all the data I received from the state. So I don't trust some of the stuff that DEM stuff. In fact, the two tanks, a thousand gallon each in North Tiverton, the only on an Excel spreadsheet that they provided me only shows one tank. The other one is not there, there but when I get a data call from them, they showed me two tanks. So who knows really is what is involved, and are they really up to date? So we need to try to find out what they do. And if it's a greater than 1,100 gallons, where's the test data? I did not find any test data at all in any of the data that I received from that data call. I would love, the, our team would love to see a regulation to uh, remove all uh, USTs, residential and farm, in two years, because we have tanks that's been in there since the oil embargo days. And it just doesn't make sense to have them in the ground anymore. And inform the in heating oil service companies. It, I believe it's now the building inspector would not allow in cement lines in Tivoli, but there's a lot of people with old installations that it's still there. And we we're wondering if the town could consider low interest UST removal loan, like the failing septic tank system, if that could be used to have low interest loans to help people out with for say put a, a, a $2,000 rock tank in and remove the old one. This is a uh, DEM deadline for single wall, December 2017. Everything that's greater than 32 years old. Uh, now the tanks in North Tibet and one was installed in 1960, but the fact that it's a thousand gallons, it, it, it's bypassed because it says this heating oil uh, is not included. And I truly believe it's, I was, it's poor engineering judgment on the part of DEM perhaps into this type of thing where you'd say, oh, it's okay, you can use heating oil or political convenience. I have to be honest, I put that in for a reason because I believe it should not have, it is something they should be addressing. And um, I think we can help them as a, a team to try to set the example and they will sometimes, I was told by one DEM official, if you set the example, we'll, we will follow you, like happened with something to do about septic systems. And a final word from the uh, Sierra Club, leaking UST is a grave threat to American groundwater. And we're not the only state. If you go to Maine and New Hampshire, there's quite a, it has the same situation, and we need to take and get a hold of it, and I think. Our goal would be is if Tiffany could set the example in the state of Rhode Island and say we have to remove them, that would be the ideal situation. And maybe the state would say anything less than 1,100 gallons has to be regulated more or in, a, in a better manner. So when I want to ask the solicitor, no, sure. we're informing you tonight of this, this environmental concern. Is the town liable if, in fact, someone's tank le leaks and the neighbor has and say, well, why didn't you have them informed? Uh, uh, no. No. I'm just asking. That's all. And the state and federal law. Yeah. Liability is always on the home. Okay. That's why I would. Not that's on good. the municipality. No, that's fine. I wanted to find that out. That was not to be create tension here. I wanted to just find out, but thank you. I think it's just yeah. giving you. Yeah, and then the uh, issue is surrounding homes for the tax assessor. If in fact there's contamination, you can't live in the uh, home next to it because you cannot taking showers. There's potential benzene inside of it, inside the oil, which can be absorbed in the skin, and, and you can't drink it if there is some that you don't not, don't realize that it is in there. It it is a problem, and uh, so that's another issue that. Would the houses drop to zero value, and in the result, you'd lose a large revenue for the town? So I guess I open it up to uh, questions from the attendees. I'd like to, uh, if I can answer them. If not, my te the team is here, as well as we'll come back to it.
Madam President. Go ahead. All right. Um, so I have, I have a couple questions. Um, one for you guys, and then actually one for Jan, since you spent some time at the DEM. Is there a particular reason that DEM did not choose to enforce USTs for the under 1,100 gallons? Or has not looked at this, or is this maybe something that DEM has looked at but decided not to? I, I don't have the definitive answer to that. I think that this probably dates back to the time when underground storage tanks were first discovered to be a serious environmental threat, okay. and it had to be prioritized in terms of where the greatest risk was that needed to be addressed first. That's my um, guess. To be honest, I don't know that for uh, a fact. I have the feeling I actually have a call into people over there to find out what the current thinking is in the in DEM. And I know that there are always two answers to that: is one is what we think should be done, and the second one is whether we have the people to do it. So that's the problem at the state level uh, as well. Okay. And then, um, you know, just the only comment that I would have uh, about the presentation, first off, you know, thank you for your work. I think it's, you know, great work. I'm glad that you're able to inform, the, you know, the residents of the town that this is an issue and hopefully more will come forward and disclose that they have one of these USTs. Um, but the only thing from the town perspective, if the liability rests strictly with the homeowner, um, that makes me a little reticent to do anything, especially in situations where it, it, this almost feels like we're essentially stepping over DEM because DEM refuses to address this issue in an area where they should. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't want to put the town in between, you know, a fight between DEM and something that they want to regulate. You know, I think that it's something we should, you know, potentially bring to DEM's attention. Maybe we, you know, put forward something in, as a resolution, council resolution that can go to DEM saying, hey, you need to look at this. But if they're already regula regulating everything else in this space, you know, the town doesn't have the expertise to regulate USTs. But DEM certainly does because they're already doing so for larger tanks. So, you know, I, I really think that it's something that we can assist you guys in getting DEM's attention on. Well, but I don't necessarily know that that we'd be in a position, you know, uh, both with knowledge base and then also on the fiscal end to be able to regulate these ourselves. Well, uh, I look at the DEM in that. Um, the, the data call that I just received three tanks, there was no indication of any type of testing being conducted on any tank. So they leave them in the ground, out of sight, out of mind. And I have to take back to you that example I gave you about Tibet and Four Corners. It would be the responsibility, not of the state of Rhode Island, but Tibet and to pay for, maybe you get federal funds to pay for water all the way down there for public water. That's the concern I have, too. That is. Yeah. Tony, that, that is the case, that Tibet is on the hook for water? in the event of a contamination by a homeowner? It happened in Montgomery Street in Florence in 1987. Tiverton had to put the water in. They put it in a $5 million bond was required. I'm going to tell you, to me, again, and I understand there was some situation back then, I don't know if there was an obligation that the town just did that, but that liability doesn't lie, lie, lie to the town. And the reason for that, well, if somebody has is not on not on it, town it, water, no. oh, okay. the obligation really isn't there. I, can I just address this for a second? Uh, I, I was just gonna because it gets it gets to uh, I think the heart of the question, and that and, and I think this is really the uh, basis of the presentation. As you can see in my memo, uh, there is a state law on this, uh, which is uh, to me in the nature of an enabling statute that allows the town uh, to regulate uh, these uh, underground storage tanks that have been the subject of uh, the presentation. And uh, the state has conferred that power on the cities and towns. And to me, at some point, somebody, and I don't know who that was, made a decision that uh, these tanks under 1,100 uh, gallons, that'd be the responsibility of the towns to regulate if they so ch chose. And then uh, over that amount, that would go over to the DEM. So you have the ability to do it under state law. Uh, the question is, is if you have this scheme, uh, is there any liability for the town if um, there is a spill and either the uh, uh, UST wasn't regulated uh, or the town was somehow negligent on that? Uh, under um, uh, federal law, and it drops down to state law, primarily, primary liability is always on the homeowner or the property owner. 
uh, if the town is negligent in any way, then it's a negligent uh, action from there. And there could be damages. There could. But uh, in this circumstance, uh, I'm going to make a suggestion uh, uh, to you all. Uh, the only thing that the town uh, can do at this point is to beef up your current uh, underground storage tank ordinance, which is on the books. It's basically a registration ordinance. There's no penalties. <coughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I think what you need to do here is get, this is a good presentation, but you need to see um, what a regulatory scheme would look like so that you can see if this is something that, that you want to undertake to address the issue. So I think the best thing to do uh, is to refer this to Jan. I was going to say you. No, no, Jan, <laughs> And I'll, no, I'll certainly. I was trying to make it him. But. Well, I'll, I'll certainly. Well, here's the thing. I, you know, it's 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 environmental. Uh, Jan has a background in this. He's very familiar with underground storage tanks, and I'll certainly help because uh, we've already started with it. But to me, the best thing to do here would be to say, this is what an ordinance could look like. This is what other towns have done uh, to address this issue. And this is what it would cost, which is another reason why I think Jan, Jan should be involved. No, we already have an ordinance. You do, but it's just a registration ordinance. Right. It so does not, okay. it doesn't go um, the whole nine yards, so to speak, under 46-12.1-1. Uh, I'd be glad to take on responsibility for uh, follow-up. I want to point out one thing, because Tom suggested that heating oil is excluded from um, what can be yes, regulated. That's not the case. Yeah. It's actually included in the definition. So oh, the no, what I was saying, excluded uh, any heating oil for less than 1,100 gallons. I may have spoke, said it wrong, because yeah. it, it says in this uh, ordinance that right here, this is directly from DEM's. Uh, right, so actually the town does have authority oh, to town. address Yes. Oh, yeah. Heating oil in residential. All right. So I just wanted to clarify that. No, I, I, apologize. Um, I do think it's best to you know charge me to work with several people actually to figure out what the next step could be uh, for the town. I think Tony is right that uh, we do have an ordinance. It hasn't been used in a very very long time, so people haven't been registering uh, either. Now, if I'm not mistaken, it's no longer legal to install underground storage when tanks. When we did that, we got the bonus pass that you could not right. put new ones in. But even so, we ought to have an up-to-date registration uh, situation, and it's sort of concerning that we, we don't have that. And that's something we, we can do and should do. I also want to point out the fire department certainly has jurisdiction over underground storage tanks and has been you know, dealing with it uh, on and off, I would say. But we can look at what the role of the fire department could be. And I understand that we need to figure out, you know, what the implications are in terms of staff, expenses, et cetera, et cetera. But I also think we can talk with DEM. And finally, I think uh, I already have a call into the uh, Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank. Um, it's always good to create incentives for people. And maybe there could be a low interest loan program similar to what they have for septic systems that could actually create an incentive for people to do this rather than us just saying, you know, you need to take it out in two years, which a little easier said than done. <coughs> well, uh, first of all, I'd like to t thank Tom and the Conservation Commission. I know that they've been working on this for a really long time, and, and it is an important issue. I, I also think that um, some of the folks who have underground storage tanks um, may not really be aware what their liability is, and, and maybe even an education campaign. A and I'm sure you could um, find a realtor or two who's sold a house where there's been an underground storage tank, they've taken the thing up, and it's a $35,000 remediation fiasco. Um, so I think some of the people who have them, if they were aware that if they're not using them anymore, and in some cases they may not be, they may still be, getting them out of the ground sooner than later may be in their own best financial interest. Um, while it's still relatively inexpensive to get it gone rather than letting it sit there and having a really significant expense at some time in the future. And, and um, I do like Jan's idea of possibly talking to the infrastructure bank about the possibility of, um, you know, low interest loan money to be able to do it for folks that needed to. Um, and at least 
you know, some portion of folks may voluntarily, with a little help, say, you know, I, I think I'd rather get this gone sooner than later. I do think ultimately somewhere down the road, um, the best solution is to get rid of all of these underground storage tanks. Um, there was another oil spill, an underground or oil tank spill, at Nonquit School many years ago, which was the town's problem. Um, and that was not inexpensive. But I will tell you this, there were several wells nearby that were um, impaired. And to this day, there's one well in the area that still tests positive. Um, almost 50 years later, still tests positive for traces of petroleum byproducts. So it, it, it's not for a place that doesn't have uh, public water everywhere. It, it's not a minor thing to have a, a significant spill that gets into a major vein in the bedrock that could have really disastrous consequences for a lot of people. So thank you for all your work on this, Tom. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Madam President, um, two questions. So one, you said that there were some USTs that were abandoned and it's that that means they were filled with sand or they, cement? They can do that. They, there's a way. You have to clean them. They have to be ex cleaned all, of all oil products and the state said they will put a slurry in of perhaps a cement and, and sand together and hold it in place. So it stays in the ground. It stays in the ground, but the optimum way is if you'd want to take it out to see if it has leaked and migrated out from the tank to avoid, especially in a well area where you have public, uh, private wells and public wells. Okay. But the top, the top, in certain instances, they will allow a, a bandit in place, but it's filled up so if it, so it won't collapse and, as it rusts. As and it cleaned, rusts. it sounds like what you said. They have to clean it well. Okay. It has to be totally cleaned to somehow get in and clean up all, spray it with something inside and, and take out all of the residuals. Okay. And the other question I have, and I don't know who could answer it, is like it sounds like there are other towns that already have programs. Are you familiar with them uh, in Rhode I, Island? Oh. All in, I thought there was some where Bristol may have some type of uh, okay. ordinance, but I don't know for sure about those because okay. I thought I was, we, I was hoping we would take them. That's no, I understand that, but I thought one of you guys said that you thought there was some town that did. What, what I'd like to take take a do uh, to take a look at one of the things I'll do with Jan is uh, do a survey of the communities to see if there are any regulations out there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? So I think what I'm understanding is we refer this to the town administrator. Yes, with the help of the town um, solicitor. And fire chief. And whatever resources mm -hmm. that you need. How's that? Could someone make that motion? Can I suggest one other thing? Yeah. You should probably ask me to report back within a certain time frame. I just thought that I, I didn't know how long it was going to well, take. Well, in fairness, because they have studied this so long, okay. and it is a pretty persuasive presentation, well, I think. It's not easy to do this, but I think setting some reasonable time July frame. July 9th? Meeting at July 9th? No, I would say six months, actually, okay. to give us some <laughs> I don't know what you're asking. All right. Well, that's why I thought whenever you get it complete, I knew you wouldn't take more than a year, but that okay. Before November, though. Before so, November. Okay. Madam President, I'll make a make a motion to refer uh, the underground storage tanks uh, regulation research to the administrator and the solicitor and whatever else internal resources they need and ask the administrator to report back no later than six months from this meeting. I thought you said before November. October? By the second meeting in October. Second. Oh, mean second, any further discussion? Just um, if, we, if we do have a list already, um, is there any way to cross-reference it to any of the tax assessor information? They, they have heating type. We're going to try to do that. I think yeah. that's, a, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And I think Tom should rat on his friends that haven't disclosed their tax. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to, but I wouldn't want to use the, yeah. but I, I, you know, the day after, excuse me, this is quick, the day after they, we pass on, there was a brand new, probably 1,100 plus gallon tank in someone's yard. I call a building inspector. Oh, he's just doing maintenance. 
<laughs> so I don't know what to say. I mean, there's nothing much I could do about it. You know how it happens yes. uh, in a yeah. small town. I won't say the name. I, I was very discreet about all of those things. So. We'll get it off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Motion's been made and second. All those in favor? I would also like to thank you in the conservation. Well, thank you very much. It was oh, a really good presentation. Yeah, thank you. This will bring closure to 31 years ago of an effort that started. <laughs> Have a great day. You you too. Thank you. Advertised public hearing CDBG 2017 grant application, second public hearing. First hearing was held in November. Council approval to file application. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, Christian Belden with Church Community Housing Corporation. As you may remember, I was just before you um, on April 23rd. At that time, the town um, held a second hearing and voted to submit the annual CDBG application. It, within that application, there was an activity for affordable housing development to create home ownership opportunities for Tiverton residents um, that are low and moderate income. And, uh, but at that time, there weren't any specific properties or um, potential buyers identified. Um, so we, it was a zero dollar activity line item within that application. Since that time, we've uh, found three buyers and executed three purchase and sales agreements for the remaining three affordable lots at Cottville Farms. So I'm back before you um, for this public hearing and then the later vote, um, hopefully uh, so that you can approve uh, a specific amount and the three specific properties. It's 425, 471, and 497 Cottrell Farm. And the uh, grant funding that we're, we're requesting to build those three homes is 415,000 in CDBG funding. Any questions from the council before I open the public hearing? At this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. Any comment from the audience? Any comments? I'd like to now close the public hearing. Any questions from the council? Just, just the date. I think it's 11 27 18. It should be 11 27 17. Where are you on the that? second page? Mm. Yeah. yeah, first hearing held 11. It says it was held 11 9 2017, and then or so it was advertised 11 9 2017. It was, it was held. Yeah, I, I, I can get a revised at. um okay. version of that. No, it wasn't held November 27, 2018. We haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, that's not, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> 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 Are we ready to vote? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll change that to 17. Um, any further questions? I get to take a motion. Madam President. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the uh, church community, uh, the CDPG 2017 grant application um, for the properties subject to the uh, date change on the form in the amount of $415,000. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Against? Opposed? Five points. Five points. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Now the next two public hearings will be continued, um, and I'll read them out, but the only thing I'm asking, um, I think we should continue them to July 9th. And the reason for that, if we bring them to June 25th, we'll have three public hearings again, like last Monday. And we were here for an unbelievably lengthy meeting. So um, I'd like to separate these two to July 9th, and then we'll have um, the outdoor seating at the end of June, and that may, may be very long. So it's the planning board discussion and um, the planning board discussion and action on proposed amendment to Article 2, Article 5, and Article 6 of the zoning ordinance to add a definition for accessory structure and alter the, the dimensional regulations applicable thereto. Continued, and I'm suggesting uh, July. Do you want me to second that or? 
Um, we would good? you make the motion, please? Yeah, uh, motion to continue uh, what you just read from uh, July from June 25th to July 9th meeting. Is that all right, Tony? Okay. Do I have a second? second. Any further discussion regarding that? All those in favor? Unanimous. And the next one was, is the planning board discussion and action on proposed amendment to Article 21, Section 10, Affordable Housing Provision, to include a fee in lieu option. And I'd like that to continue until July 9th. Also. So moved. Second. I think it's July 9th, isn't it? Yes. Yes, okay. Motion's been made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Did you want to like move it to maybe even like the next meeting after that? Because we had a lengthy discussion on accessory structures. Yeah, we did too. So, so what you're suggesting is separating all, um, all, all of three. them. I have more coming up that I'll just space in between. No, it. I think that's a good idea actually. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I really Joe is right. They, they all took an hour or more. more. Yeah. Uh, and and if there's other ones, there might be variances, you know, sound variances and stuff. You can filter in weddings and stuff like that. But I don't. Is there other so zoning ordinance changes or? There's not a lot. These were the, the ones we have to finish. Madam President, I'd like to amend my motion from uh, July 9th to the second meeting in July. Which would be the 23rd. 23rd. I'll second that. You second the amendment. Yeah. Motions are made. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Boom. Moving on. Love it. Um, Walgreen Eastern Company Incorporated DBA Wright Oil, number 10235677 Main Road, corporate change of ownership. Request approval of tobacco dealer license and holiday license, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Anyone here from this company? Um, no, they okay. were informed, but it's a uh, just a change of ownership. Madam President. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a uh, motion to approve the tobacco dealer license and holiday license uh, for uh, Walgreen Eastern Company Incorporated DBA Rite Aid number 10235, 677 Main Road, uh, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Second. Motion been made and second. Any um, discussion? All those in favor? Advertise show cause hearing petroleum storage license. Sahid Assam Afzal. I probably slaughtered that. Um, A A1 Petroleum DBA Stonebridge Gas 861 Main Road. The solicitor. Okay, the first question uh, is, is, is there anyone here from A1 Petroleum doing business as Stonebridge Gas? Is Mr. Saeed Hassan Afsal here? M Madam President, the record should reflect that uh, the uh, licensee or representative is not here. But we do have uh, Mr. Mello, who is the uh, town's fire marshal here. I'm going to recommend that uh, an oral proof of claim be made in regard to this license. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to say that. We need to swear him in. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tom, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that you will tell the truth? Yes. Thank you. Now, I, I know everybody knows this, but uh, for record purposes, state your name. Thomas Mello. And where are you employed? Tiverton Fire Department. And what is your position with the Tiverton Fire Department? I'm the fire marshal. How long have you held that position? Uh, about two and a half years now. In your capacity as the uh, town's fire marshal, have you had occasion to uh, inspect uh, the premises at 861 Main Road uh, doing business as uh, Stonebridge Gas and owned by A1 Petroleum? Yes, I have. And what did you observe when you were there? Uh, violations of self-serve versus full serve. Well, specifically, what, what was going on that you observed? So they were allowing people to do self-serve uh, at the pumps rather than full serve as required. Okay, what's the difference? Uh, full serve requires an attendant be out there and people stay in their vehicles and the attendant pumps the gas for them. 
Uh, it's a whole different safety suppression system has to be in place if it's a self-serve station. There's greater um, uh, 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 safety and uh, fire suppression uh, services at, uh, um, at the uh, self-serve? Self-serve will have a full suppression system. By Rhode Island fire laws, there's a full suppression system that goes on the overhead canopy at all self-serve stations. So for this particular establishment, uh, uh, motorists were pumping their own gas uh, at a uh, full-serve station without those protections. That's correct. In your opinion, is that a public safety hazard? Yes. Did you advise the owner? Uh, over eight times in the past three years. Did you advise the operator? Yes. And what did the operator say? In one of the uh, meetings that I had with one of the operators, they said, do you expect us to go outside and pump gas for people? Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, what are you recommending that the town council as the board of licenses do with this particular license? Uh, in conversations with the state fire marshal's office, the recommendation is to suspend their license for four weeks. And uh, did you have a conversation recently with the uh, operator, uh, Mr. Afzal? Yes. Did he say that he was closing the business? He said as of June 30th, his lease was up, so he would do the best he could to comply, but didn't expect to be able to. Okay. Okay, does, does the board have any questions for, uh, for Tom? Anyone? No. no. Thank you. Four weeks. I, they have to reapply for a new license. That was my question. Now, I, I do have a question. So we give them four weeks. If they don't comply, they're closed. That's Is correct, that correct, yes. And, and furthermore, um, because there has been some indication that there will be a new operator uh, at this site, uh, that new operator would be required to apply for a new license. The old license could not transfer out. And I think that uh, uh, Tom is, is correct in asking for a uh, four-week, uh, actually, revocation of this license. Uh, if the operator can demonstrate that uh, um, uh, he would operate this um, establishment in a safe manner for the public. That would be a different story, but I do think that the four four weeks is warranted here. With notice to the owner and operator. Any questions from the council? Council Perry. So is he is he closed as of now, or is he still able to run a business until June thirtieth? Well, he, he did, and I'm, I'm going to say this. It's my understanding that uh, the business is closed, correct? That's correct. Okay. However, if you don't take this action, he could open up tomorrow and it be because he has a license. Sure. So that's why that's I, 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 I He closed on his own this morning. <clears throat> yes. But I agree with the recommendation of the fire marshal. I think it's prudent to take that course so uh, the operator can't reopen. Sure. Any other questions? Any other questions from the council? Yeah, I'm going to refer it to the clerk. I'd like to entertain a motion. Madam President. Councilor Edwards. I'd like to make a motion to um, follow the uh, recommendations of the fire marshal and the solicitor uh, and impose a four-week revocation uh, for the license uh, for petroleum storage um, for Syed, Hassan, Afzal, A1 Petroleum, DBA Stonebridge Gas at 861 Main Road uh, and provide notice to both the owner and the operator. Second. Any further? Yes. Yeah. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I Appointments and resignation. Library Board of Trustee, three year term, two vacancies. Kim Sutherland, 199 Fury Avenue, new appointment. Thank you. That is listed, um, that is the terms of a library uh, Board of Trustee. However, there are two unexpired terms. So this appointment would actually fill an unexpired term till October 15, 2018. And then and maybe we could just put it on for three years at that point. Because I can't go longer than the three year and it 
has to be in right. October. Right. So October 15th, if she, if she still wants to do it. <laughs> right. Um, Kim, if you just want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in this position. Um, sure. I, I have lived in Tiverian most of my life and have uh, gone to Essex Library since I was a little girl. I am an avid reader, I'm a writer, I am a teacher, and I am a mom, and I've had occasions to visit the library under all those hats. Um, I think that the library is a jewel in the crown of this town, and I would like to um, be a steward to help bring the library forward. Any questions for Kim? I'd entertain a motion. Madam President. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, Trish. Madam President, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Kim Sutherland. We have to uh, waive our normal procedure on this, right? Oh, yeah, do we? Yeah. Well, there's only oh, one it's applicant, and it's only one. There's six. two openings. So yeah, so it's fine. So we don't have to waive the normal procedure of kick it off till the next Not meeting? Okay. I just want to make sure we're by the book. No, good job. That's good. Just one question. Um, I, are you a special needs teacher today? Yes. And do you work for the town? No, no I do not. Okay. Just want to verify. Yeah, <laughs> no, she doesn't. There you go. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Kim Sutherland to um, the Library Board of Trustees to fulfill a term. So October, October 15th, I'm looking 2018. At the clerk. October 15th, 2018. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you, Kim. Thank, Thank you, you, neighbors. <laughs> How do you follow? <laughs> Small town politics, I love it. You know. Yeah. DBW Director William Anderson, who isn't here, but I'm sure Jan's going to do this. Approval of 2017 MyDem. Right Pets, I'm sorry, MS4 report for submission to right now. Jan, are you taking this? Yes, this is the report that needs to be submitted to DEM uh, annually. Um, it was prepared by our consultants uh, together with Bill. Uh, in your packet, you had a summary uh, of what transpired in uh, the past year, including uh, work that was undertaken to deal with stormwater in particular. And um, I hope that provides you with enough information. The report itself is, is much lengthier and has more specifics in it. If anyone wants a copy of it, I can provide that. I recommend that you approve. Any discussion from the council? Questions? Madam, Madam President? Um, is that report in digital format? Uh, yes. Would you be able to email it to me? Do you? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, and with that, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the 2017 RIDEM RIPDES MS4 report for submission to Rhode Island DEM. Motion has been made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. Jan, if you could also email me a copy. Okay. Thank you. Tibbet and Fire Department Chief Lloyd requests approval of transfers to cover overtime needs <coughs> from account 3310 5101 personnel for $10,000, account 3310 5111 EMS incentive for $2,000. Account 3310-5168, clothing allowance for $1,983.02. Account 3310-5107, paid holidays for $389.79. Account 3310-5110, educational allowance for $153.50. Account 3310-6923, chief seminars for $43.74. $43.74, totaling $14,570.05 to account 3310-5104 overtime. Any discussion? Jan? Thank you. And the chief couldn't be here tonight. He, he had to be in a, in a different uh, meeting uh, together with other staff. I thought maybe Tom was going to address it. But we have in your uh, packet uh, a memo <coughs> explaining I know that there has been quite a bit of discussion of how much overtime uh, was being incurred by uh, the fire department. I do believe that uh, a very serious effort has been made to bring that under control. 
Um, in the memo, it's explained that the chief has been able to hire uh, two uh, firefighters laterally, um, and also that some people have come back from sick leave. Um, on the other hand, um, they had hoped to hire a third lateral, and uh, that person chose to go to a different uh, department. So that was uh, a little bit of a setback um, to which this additional overtime um, is to be attributed. Uh, the good news is that this can be covered within the budget of the fire department itself, itself instead of requiring a different transfer. I, I would approve, I would suggest approval, recommend approval. I'd like to make a motion to uh, move money from accounts 3310-5101, 3310-5111, 3310-5111, 3310-5111, 3310-5111, 3310-5110, in an amount totaling $14,570.05 to account 3310-5104 over time. Second. Motion to remain in second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Town of Administrator, approval of transfer of $6,000 from account 1060-5175 uh, part-time building inspector to account 1050-7159 litigation. Thank you. Uh, we were having a negative balance in that account already. Uh, for some reason, we seem to be um, incurring lots of litigation costs. <laughs> so um, additional money is needed in that account. We do have uh, money in the part-time building inspector account that hasn't been used uh, this year. So the suggestion is that we take that money out of that account at this point. I, I will say that I expect an additional transfer may be necessary um, before the end of the fiscal year, actually. This is not the last of it yet. Any questions from the council? Madam President. Council Edwards. Well, I'd like to make a motion to approve the transfer of $6,000 from account 1060-5175, part-time building inspector, to account 1050-7159, litigation. Motion to remain. Do I have a second? Second. Motion to remain second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Bids and requests for proposals. Councilor Hilton, DPW, Director. Dash CBW Director, award of contracts for Grinnell's Beach renovation, concrete sidewalks, and pavilion slab. Um, and we just received that, right? Yeah, yeah. Madam President, we, we really just got this, uh, it, or we got this in on Friday, but it really took till today to be able to review some of these prices um, and try and make a decision. Um, based on these items that we bid for, um, Tonight, we're asking only to award um, one item off of the bid list. Um, and again, just to uh, refresh everybody's memory, in the formal advertised bidding process, we received no bids. So under Rhode Island law, we were allowed to go out and solicit um, bids from various contractors. I know that at least three were contacted. Only one chose to. Um, submit a bid um, but for tonight um, we'd like to award um, the contract work for on page two under alternative bid prices um, a and B which you can see are the same prices at the end um, it's only going to be one of those things, but it is to be determined since they're the same price from a design point of view, which one we go with, um, to John Rocchio Corporation. Tony, this is okay? Well, under 45-55-6, yes. And it's my understanding that originally when the uh, request for proposal went out, it was the option uh, for the bidders to bid separately on these items. Because of that, and because no bids came back, uh, it's ex I think actually uh, uh, Bill did the right thing by going out for a so-called uh, competitive negotiation. So you want us to approve both? Uh, well, 
I think you can approve 90,720 and yeah, then you decide the number and then the committee will decide between the two they're the same price um, from a design point of view which one works. Oh, either the so A or B, but the, uh, for a total of 90,720. So you're only going to pick one of those? Yes. 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 Madam so President. What we're really asking is to, to just you know, approve the amount approve and then the later amount on you'll determine and which one. One of those two things there is the identical amount. Councilor Hilton, do we have $90,720 to pay for this? And um, where are we going to get the remainder of the work that was asked for the bid spec from? So, yes, we do. Um, as part of the, the grant and private funds that were raised, um, as far as the other things, we're going to plan B. We have some alternatives, various alternatives in mind. Um, we're going to reach out to possibly, um, we may rebid this and we may reach out to some smaller shops that would be more interested in doing the smaller pieces. That big slab is very, it's a complicated pour. Um, it's not for everybody. It's gonna require a construction company with a certain amount of expertise. Um, and we may find that we get bids on the smaller pieces of it. There may also be some opportunity for us to do some in-house work too. Um, we'll be creative, but we'll find a way to get it done. But yes, it, we, we do have the money for this lab. How, how much money do we have left in that account? The, the only reason I ask is because I know we're doing a lot of this stuff piecemeal, and mm -hmm. um, and I understand that there's a reason for that because we needed to, you know, conserve the money. We weren't sure how much how much we're going to raise. Um, it's just the only question I have is, you know, going into a construction project. You know, I would have hoped that we would have identified sort of everything we wanted to do, known exactly what it was going to cost us, and then you know now we're getting whacked with some of the sticker shock stuff. Um, that's got me a little concerned. Well. Um, actually, no. This bid is a little bit higher than what our estimate was, but frankly, it's not that much higher than our, our original estimate was. And, and so far, our estimates have been pretty much on target. Um, you know, the, the slab price is a little bit higher, but not by a whole lot. The other components... On this bid from this particular company, they're a little high, but that might be because these are sort of smaller jobs and, you know, sometimes when things are smaller, um, you don't have quite as much interest in them. Um, but I, I'm not sure I could quote a number off of the top of my head, but I can tell you right now that the treasurer could assure you that we are nowhere near um, cost overruns or not going to have the all the funds necessary to complete this project. What, what was just out of curiosity, um, not that it really matters for this, but what was the original estimate for all this work? On this lab? Yeah. The original estimate for broom finish, not the aggregate yep. finish, but the original estimate for the broom finish was $60,000 and their number came in at seventy five. You know, remember the estimates were done when we were putting together the DEM grant application, that was a couple of years ago, the price has come, you know, steel's gotten more expensive, the rebar costs more than it did back then, things have yeah. gone up, but it's not... Trade wars and all that stuff. Yeah, it's not completely out of the realm compared to what we estimated, and frankly, a number of the things that we estimated, almost everything except for this, has come in at a lower number than what we estimated in the, in the original planning of this. So we're going to be okay with $30,000 more on the approval than was estimated? I, I promise you I wouldn't ask it if, if we weren't. Yeah, we okay. are. Because, you know, we have been. We've been really lucky. We've had incredible uh, members of the community step forward and have donated materials that we thought we were going to have to buy. I mean, it's, it's been great. So we're in really good shape, actually. I can entertain a motion. I just don't want to overpay for the other things, so yeah. um, it, we'll, we'll look for other options on some of the items, some of the other items. Madam President. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the award of uh, the contract to John Rocchio Corporation uh, under the alternate bid prices for a grand total of $90,720 for the uh, supply and installation of a 45 by 90 foot uh, six inch thick slab 
with a finish to be determined by the committee. I have a second. Second. Motion for main and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It's, Madam President, if it would, at some point when we have a schedule that's not too busy, I'm more than happy to give everybody an update on the finances, by the way. Yeah, or I mean, you could send something out too. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. we may very well have it, and it's probably in a pile in my house, so. <laughs> okay, we'll schedule something when, when uh, probably in July. Okay, um, town administrator announcements. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I probably should have more announcements, but I only have one that I was asked to make about uh, a planned flag burning ceremony or flag retirement ceremony by the Boy Scouts, Troop Number 4218, flag retirement ceremony at Tiverton Town Hall on Flag Day, June 14th at 6 p.m. Uh, to honor Tiverton's first responders. So I just wanted to let people know that that's happening this week. Thank you. Um, council announcements. I, I, I do have um, an announcement. We, um, I have talked with the Charter Commission. Our original date of June 19th was not going to work for the solicitor. Um, we found out later. And I believe you all got an email to ask if you could make it June 20th. Um, I know I heard from some. Joan, can you make it? I yeah, I, I missed the third sentence. I just automatically assumed that it was oh, okay. the 20th. Okay, so it's June yeah. 20th. Um, I talked to Rob Coulter today. Um, they will be submitting some some of their finished work to us June 15th. They're trying <laughs> to um, um, they're trying to decide which ones they want to come with us first. Um, what's more important to them and then go down the list um, so they will be submitting some stuff to us on June 15th and they will uh, probably give us some on the Monday too because they're gonna work on it that that weekend we will not receive all of it but I told them that was fine we needed to stop making decisions and um, talk about some of this so uh, the minute I get it I'll have Nancy give you all of it um, on June 15th and he assures me that I will receive something on June 15th. Any questions? Madam so it will be June 20th. We're trying to make it here at Town Hall. It, it will be here. Um, the zoning meeting was supposed to be here, but we asked them to go to the senior center. Be oh, it's canceled. Okay. It's 7 o'clock? It will be 7 o'clock. Just a quick question on that. Um, and I apologize for not knowing this off the top of my head because I know we discussed this at the last meeting, but did we not say we needed everything by a specific date? Well, I, I just I'm worried about getting things piecemeal and then having something break, be slid everything. in at the last minute. You know, we did talk about everything. They have some approved. They're still trying. They're still making decisions on others. Um, they are trying to kind of take them all and compact them really. Um, so I told them whatever he had from June 15th, um, and I thought you would all agree we should start looking at it. Because there's 80 some right now, guys. So, so let's. Down from 126. So well, good. there might be, I'm saying 80 some, but it might be 126. I'm not sure. So I asked him. I thought they were trying to get it down to 20 or 30. They're trying to get it down to 20 or 30. Okay. So we'll, I asked we'll them. them. Yeah, I asked them to um, at least submit some stuff because this is going to be a long process and we're hoping to get this on the November election and we have to run public hearings and it has to be uh, uh, submitted for the ballot in August. So at least we can start this progress and go from there. I have one final question. Um, in the event that their commission, that that Charter Review Commission terminates before they're able to whittle this number down, um, obviously this is a very important uh, piece of work and it's and it's our job um, so perhaps we could just request that if they are unable to come up with a final list that they submit us everything that they discussed that was heard in front of the Commission so that we can make those determinations because I'm concerned that we're gonna get into a situation where you know they're gonna run over they're gonna start looking for extensions or something along those lines and you know we, we have a deadline that we have to adhere to 
I spoke with Rob. He was very cooperative. Um, he said that he will get as many to us as possible. And they were still in discussion to try to whittle this down. So um, it, I have to say it was a positive discussion. So um, we'll just hope for the best June 20th. And then we'll go from there. Does everyone agree? Okay. It's at the town hall? Yes, it'll be here. Any other um, announcements from the town council? Con congratulate the girls, Tiverton High girls oh. softball team. Mm -hmm. They won the state championship. Yes, a big congratulations. And I'd like to congratulate all um, the high school graduates. Joan and I were there. It was a wonderful uh, ceremony outside. First time in many, many years, and they did a really good job. And I'd like to thank the school committee for inviting us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, school committee, for inviting us. Uh, no, I asked him. He said, yeah, yeah. "You missed it." He doesn't well, have announcements. <laughs> he, he usually has nothing. I only cool. have one quick one, <laughs> but but I think if you're going to be on these um, charter proposed amendments, you might want to start thinking of what dates in July you would want your public hearings because yeah. um, it gets difficult last minute to schedule some. So maybe we by the next meeting you 10, can think ten days in advance. Right? I, it's a public. It's a public hearing, but it's a public we don't. Hearing, but there's no, there's no uh, requirements for advertising. Okay. Be advertised, but <clears> yeah, we All right, but but there's no requirements. So Nancy will but discuss it at the next meeting. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, I think you and I we just can get. Some. Yeah, we can get some dates. I just yeah. think you ought to. Yeah, because we need to get down. It. Okay. But the only other um, item I have is that the anyone who chooses to. Uh, run for elected office in the town in November. I just want to remind you that the declaration period is uh, to file a uh, declaration of a candidacy is June 25th, 26th, and 27th. Only during those three days can the clerk's office accept the form. However, you can go right online at the Secretary of State's. You can fill the form out right online and print it out. It requires two witnesses. We do, um, of course, we'll have some printed out here, and we have a little booklet um, for anybody, especially new people, on being a voter. They did have a, a class on this. I think uh, Kelly LeBeck said she attended it uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was actually some, she sent me the information, and it was some informative stuff there, too. So I'm just letting you know that they will be available. We'll have them here, but you can get them right online. Thank you. Um, Council Edwards. Madam President, I'd like to make a motion to, yeah, to continue um, from our executive session earlier. Uh, litigation, Rhode Island General Law 42465A2, Four Corners. Councilor Perry. Second. Sorry. Um, yes. 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 And continuing in uh, closed executive session, Councilor Ryan, potential litigation, Rhode Island General Law 42465A2, sports wagering. Second. Yes. 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 And continuing in closed executive session, Town Administrator, Rhode Island General Law 42465A6, prospective business, industrial park. Second. Yes. 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 And continuing in closed executive session, Town Administrator 42465A2, update on collective bargaining, IBPO, and IAFF. Second. Yes. 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 And continuing in closed executive session, Town Administrator 42465A1, personnel, distribution of annual evaluation for tax collector, Tony Lynn McGowan, notice given. Second. Yes. 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 